Welcome to A Voice from the Hills. I'm James Warner, co-founder of Silicon Hills Wealth Management here in Austin, Texas. Our guest on today's podcast is quite literally one of the new faces in media, Nicole Kasperson. She's a reporter turned creator, a journalist turned curator, and an unabashed advocate for diversity and inclusion. But she's also one of the best resources for up-to-date info on fintech. Her What the Fintech weekly publication and podcast is a must-read and a must-listen. And the subscriber base is growing rapidly. So please join me in welcoming Nicole Kesperson. James Warner is the founding partner of Silicon Hills Wealth Management. All opinions expressed by James, his co-host, and guest are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Silicon Hills Wealth Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of Silicon Hills Wealth Management may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. Hi, Nicole, and thank you for taking the time to join us. Hi, James. I'm so excited to be here. You have been my hype man, one of my biggest supporters since like very early on when I've started my journey. So super honored to be here. And thank you. Just thank you so much. Well, I, I feel like you're that really cool band that I discovered before uh, before they got really <laughs> popular. So uh, yeah. so I, exactly. I feel the same way. So thank you for joining us. Let, let's talk about uh, your shift from reporter to creator. Uh, you, you talk about that in in your podcast and in your writing. Walk us through what that transition looks like. Yeah, it's um, it's a bigger transition than one might think because when I first started um, transitioning from like traditional reporter to creator, I remember thinking like I've technically been a content creator my entire career. I've been doing this the last five years. Like, how different could this be? Oh man, is it totally different? For me, the biggest transition was um, actually getting rid of that like second skin, that that layer of that front facing layer that you create when you are a traditional journalist. Um, you know, you have a you have an editor and you have all these people that, you know, have to remind you that traditional journalism is, you know, you're not actually able to express your opinions, your personality and that type of thing. Uh, you're not allowed to editorialize, basically. Um Fast forward to today, and now we're in a world where, you know, content is king. Creators are the ones influencing businesses. They're influenced decision-making by investors. And um, so there's just so much more power there. But also, for me, it's really more about having the autonomy to elevate the stories that I think um, matter and the ones that I think don't get as much coverage. So that's kind of why I made the switch. And one of the biggest hurdles, you have to like self-reflect a lot. You have to, I've gone through like so many ups and downs trying to figure out what voice I wanted to give uh, the the world, I guess. Um, So you have to just do a ton of reflecting, a lot of planning. Um, I think a lot of people think I just like switched, like made a switch like that, but no, that was like months of planning, Um, you know, photographers, creative people coming in and helping me make the switch. Like, yeah. So you don't, you have to, you have to, how play. much of the, how much of the structure do you miss? You know, yeah. I mean, on, on the one hand, it's on the one hand, it's a hassle when you, you, when you can't be yourself and you've got to please your editor and you've got a, a deadline and all this other stuff, but there is a, there is a certain amount of structure that that puts around you. Was that, was that a hard transition to make? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I would be, I'd be lying if I said that, you know, all of my autonomy is just like the greatest and it's all like rainbows and butterflies. Um, I definitely am a structure kind of person. Actually. I, I need deadlines. I have, I have to tell my, my folks here at work week, like, give me, just give me a deadline. Like that'll work for me. <laughs> um, even if it's like flexible and I know that I kind of change it a little, but, um, yeah, I do- you're in charge of me. I need that. Yeah, I know. I mean, just like a little, I think when it comes to content, I love more than anything being in the driver's seat, I would never change that. I love being my own chief content officer. Um, But when it comes to the structure, I think that you have to to allocate every minute to uh, something that I'm creating, right? Or a a podcast I'm speaking on as a guest or um, a panel or whatever it is. So you have to be your own, you know, kind of person to give that structure to. But if you can also surround yourself with like a team that is willing to support you, you know, like I have a manager, I have... Um, you know, a whole organization of operating. I have a whole podcast team um, that helps me produce the podcast now. It wasn't like that at the beginning though, guys. So um, now it is. And so it's definitely, it's it's a hard transition. And I am really relying on people that are more of my peers. 
So, um, and also just relying a lot more on myself to create that structure. And when you made the move away from traditional media, conventional reaction was, man, that's risky. You didn't see it that way at all, did you? Not, I mean, I, at the beginning I did. And I definitely think now, I mean, when I was thinking about the transition, right, it's, of course, it's, I mean, especially I'm a woman, right? Like we are inherently a bit more um, cautious uh, about changing jobs, about the risks of things, you know, more cautious of our stability. Um, so yeah, I, but I did get like, um, when it came to kind of like making the switch, I guess I, I thought, felt it was very, very odd that more, a lot of people were telling me it was risky. It's like somewhat of a like backhanded compliment, but I guess I had to express to people that, you know, we are in the great reshuffle. We are in this like great resignation where people aren't going to work for a place that they don't feel valued or work for at a place where the, their passions aren't there um, or they aren't able to express them. So to me, and the media landscape is changing so much, to me, it would have been far riskier to stay. It would have been riskier to stay in a traditional model that is not on the path of change, um, that is just on the path of staying exactly the same. I mean, I think we're going to see a world one day where, and we're already seeing it, right? Like you don't have to you don't have to be in, you know, working at a major publication to make change. You don't have to... Um, have a huge platform to influence business decisions. You can work on your niche audiences. You can, you know, influencing just like one person and letting that trickle down. You know, I sit at the same dinner table as some really prominent people and I've never like worked at a major media brand in my life. Well, well, I think that, I think there is the ability for your work to speak for itself. And uh, of course that, that was what attracted me to you originally. Uh, I, I had no idea even who you were. I just read some of your stuff and I was like, Oh, this is really fantastic. Thank uh, you. And so, so that's an interesting way to meet somebody. I, I think part of that great reshuffle. And I know that Jim O'Shaughnessy talks about it a lot. I, I think the, you know, the idea is I don't necessarily know the background of a person. I don't know their gender. I really don't know their age. I just look at their work first and their work kind of sells me before I fall into all those, you know, traditional biases, but, but mm -hmm. let's talk about work week and, and, uh, what the FinTech, which is a cool name, by the way. Thank you. And that's W T F I N T E C H. What yes. the FinTech question uh, mark. <laughs> so yeah, question mark. So, you know, what is it? What do you hope to achieve from it? Uh, what do your subscribers receive? What's your, What's, what's the vision for it for you? Yeah, absolutely. So What the Fintech is a full-on fintech news source created and hosted by me. I'm the, the founder. I deliver a podcast weekly and um, I write a newsletter twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. If you haven't signed up, feel free to do it. Um, but my content covers all things from you know what's trending in fintech to analysis and bigger news um, that is and how that is impactful to our industry. Uh, for me, it was really important to put a human lens to our fintech and finance and technology world. I think during the pandemic, we've come to realize that, you know, our, our businesses are much more human than we have ever thought. Um, and so I always make sure that that is kind of at the, at the core. And that's kind of why, you know, one of my favorite things that uh, was recently written about me was an article that said that I am to traditional media what fintech is to traditional finance. So... Ooh. Yeah, I like that. It's my favorite. Oh my gosh, it, it was it's a high compliment. Uh, thanks, ETF Trends. But um, and it's because I'm I'm building something with so much intention of the fact that um, you know, women's stories have not been told in the same way as male stories, or that people of color haven't gotten the same coverage in in news cycles because you know, in a traditional newsroom, it's oh well we can't cover them. They don't have enough money or they haven't done enough or they haven't done this, but you know, there's so many different societal discre uh, discrepancies that lead into that, you know, whereas I find so much value in maybe a black CEO of a FinTech company saying, Hey, you know what? I wasn't even on the map until you wrote about me. And now people want to know me people. I have like connection to an investor. I have, you know, help now because you, you know, took the time to get to know me and know what I'm building. Um, so that's where I find it. You know, with so many new entries into fintech and, and different plugins and everything that's going on, how, how do you keep up? How do you identify and and curate the ideas and the yeah and, and just the things that you spotlight? Because there's so much. 
Yeah, I guess for me, because I truly do believe that like fintech can change the world for the better by giving people more access to tools that promote financial freedom. And you know, I, I think about how fintech is this alternative to financial serve, like traditional financial services. And my lens is leaders running the fintech companies are still looking and operating like traditional finance, or if those are the only the stories that we're seeing, then you know, we're not going to change a thing. I'm here to say, hey, we can be different. We can innovate. We can, you know, build fintech teams that reflect that increasingly diverse audience that fintech is actually after. Um, so that's kind of the like idea there. When I think about that lens, that actually helps me. And I keep that North Star with me. I, that helps me decipher through the news that I'm going to cover. Obviously, right now, and I know we'll get into what's happening in Ukraine, um, but that for me is like top, top, top priority. I mean, that I said I focus on human elements. I mean, that is the the only thing uh, that should be at the top of your of your stories, uh, newsletter writers, in my opinion. Um, but and that is our job to relate them to relate stories like that to our industry. But other than that, I just I I really just focus on what I think. My it's more so when you're a creator about my audience follows me for me. You know, they follow me because I'm not an institution. They follow me because they're going to trust that what I'm writing about is the news that they should be paying attention to. So as long as I'm true to me, then I can kind of, you know, read through the news, read through my Google alerts and then decide from there, read through the press releases that I get pitched, like all those thousands that I get pitched and then decide, <laughs> OK, what, what am I actually going to think is interesting? Because my audience is inherently interested in what I'm interested in. Right. Because they're like uh, they've become. Um, invested in the person that I am. Like that's what's cool about the creator economy and about uh, content creation with like different journalists is you're invested in the person and not so invested in just like a brand or an institution. And, and you write about the promise of fintech all the time, but yeah. the thing I like about your writing is you don't shy away from the flaws either. Uh, yes. So where's fintech doing well? Where's it working? And where's there more work to do? Yeah. Um, I mean, I had mentioned that I, I really do call on the fintech industry to ensure that they're actually creating products that, that they say they are, i.e. products that are going to give access to more financial tools to more people. Um, you know, I, the combination of finance and technology does really have the ability to change the world, to help build you know, financial equity. And there is no societal equity without financial equity. So it is important for me to call on the industry when they are doing a bad job, uh, which is what is happening now. Um, you know, when, when, when less than two, what, less than 3% of VC funding is going into the hands of female founders, that's a problem. It's not a pipeline problem. There, there are plenty of women out there running amazing fintech companies. There's plenty of people of color doing the same. And, um, so yeah, for me, that's one of the huge areas that I like to call out the industry and, and really we have to uh, acknowledge the, the numbers that we see, right? What it's. 12 percent um i believe of, of ceos in fintech and we have to acknowledge that you know those those numbers really really matter and they're not just you know a diversity segment on you know your your uh, it's like a sidebar on your top news story right like this is oh, no no that that's a fundamental problem this is a fundamental problem because what ends up it all trickles down it's all connected when you know you don't see that that leadership at the top then or you, the money isn't going into you know women's hands then that inherently makes the products and the business that you're creating not innovative and not diverse enough. And you're not going to appeal to the audience, like a larger audience. At the end of the day, um, you know, one of the biggest trends right now is that the industry is taking notice of that young female BIPOC media savvy investor that's really dominating the market. They're poised to inherit, what is it, $68 trillion in, in the greatest general generational wealth transfer in the coming years. So um, yeah, there's just like... <laughs> So much to, to unpack there. That's why, like, I it's so interesting to me to like talk to like advisors about why it's so important that they're building out their tech stack or like doing things differently and and focusing on on technology because it's so that they can access more clients and do their jobs better. Because if you don't start now, like you're going to get ahead behind, like you're going to be behind the curve. Um, and so well, that, and I think thinking through your tech stack in an inclusionary through an inclusionary lens is really important mm -hmm. because I mean the thing that we don't want to do as financial advisors or or anyone in our industry really is we don't want to exclude people we don't want to exclude them for 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 age or race or gender or understanding or tech phobia or whatever it happens to be I mean 
the the idea behind our tools and systems is that they should bring more people into the tent. They should be more inclusive. Uh, you know, let's turn our attention to Ukraine for a second because that yeah. was, I don't think the average person outside of our industry, and p- frankly, a lot of people in our industry, know the importance of the country to fintech and and really, actually, they probably don't know the makeup of those companies and how they're doing things a lot better than you know, actually we are. Uh, can you give us an idea of the role that Ukraine plays in the overall industry and how they're doing it different? Yeah. So the reason you know I wrote the story that I didn't trust me, I had no idea either. Um, I had to just research. You know, I, I really carefully looked into Ukraine's uh, fintech marketplace and to get a better understanding of like how they're seeing fintech, right? We think about it so much from our lens here in the States. Um, so what I learned is that, you know, in 2010, Ukraine was one of just 55 countries that made a public commitment to advancing financial inclusion, doing that through fintech. Um, so to be able to, or to, to, you know, lose that because of the fact that they are going through a war right now um, would be completely just detrimental to the fact that you know, we only have so many countries that are even dedicating themselves to this, um, to financial inclusion. So that to me was a huge, um, it was like, it's like, it's like a heartbreak, right? Like to lose any of that, you know, they, um, of the fintechs, like Ukraine is doing way better than, than the U S when it comes to, um, uh, having female CEOs, right. They are, uh, in Ukraine, 27%, um, of fintech companies are headed or co-founded by women, whereas, Globally, it's closer to like 10 to 12 percent of fintechs founded by women and uh, only six percent have a female CEO. So there's that. Right. So they're even you know, they were progressing a little bit uh, you know, better than us, I guess, than if you want to put it that way. It's not necessarily competition. But anyway, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, but like and then um, it's yeah, hard not and, to draw the comparison, though. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. And so, um, yeah, it just like but it and they kind of just started fintech growth. Um, it was like around like 2015, 2017, when like fintech really started to make an impact, obviously a lot through like transfers and payments. Um, but you know, they, they have just like kind of gotten the ball rolling on starting their infrastructure and like really growing. And like, there's like 235 fintech startups in Ukraine now. And like, but look what's happening, you know, they're not that like their worlds are completely rocked. They're, you know, if, if, you know, you're not someone who fled, then you're someone who stayed to fight with your, with an army. Um, so yeah, lives are, it's it's not just the, it's not just the FinTech startups either. Right. I mean, it's the collaboration and the partnerships. I mean, we have, it's a whole ecosystem of employees and subcontractors and advisors. I mean, we've got larger FinTech players here who have employees and subcontractors in in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I I thought your story on, uh, uh, Dmitry Norenko, Mm-hmm. Am I saying the name right? I think that's right. I mean, uh, I didn't ask him how to say his last name right. Uh, I think it's right. That really brought it home for me on on how many different levels this. Uh, for those people who didn't have a chance to read what you wrote or understand, can you kind of share some of that story with us? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that fintech often garners conversation around taking care of people, um, and that's where my passion right stems uh, in in fintech. And, you know, Dimitri's story, he's the founder and CEO of uh, a fintech company called Upswat. It basically is just like a white label uh, portal that kind of helps bring like data to uh, financial institutions so that they can better work with their small to medium sized business clients. Okay, so that's what the company does. Uh, They don't work with any Russian entities, but uh, Dimitri is Ukrainian himself. He is located in North Carolina. But his entire team, um, you know, from like CEO, COO to like CTO and to the, you know, uh, to like a data scientist, they are based in Ukraine. And so about three weeks and That's ago, a group of about, what, 80 people? Is that 80, right? Yeah, it's about 80 people. So um, three weeks ago, like even before Russia officially invaded, he, um, you know, was really proactive. He told his team, look, if you want to relocate, like tell me like to the States, I will fund it, like your families, your dogs, your wife, like whatever it is, I will pay, we, we will pay for it. And, um, you know, he said about half of his employees took that offer to, to leave, relocate. Some of them have also relocated to just, you know, more uh, safe places in Ukraine. So 
But he said a lot of his men, like a lot of the men on his team decided to stay. They wanted to fight. They wanted to, you know, uh, uh, they were not going to leave his home, his home country. His parents are still there. They also refused to leave. So, you know, there's just like a lot of, he was like, you know, my, my, my head's fuzzy, obviously, right? Like I'm still running my fintech company. I'm still having to deal with closing deals. I'm still communicating to clients. Like we're fine. Like we're, we're chugging along, but at the end of the day, like my heart is in Ukraine, like because of what's happening. And so, um, but he's not missing a beat with his work. And then he's financially supporting his, his team, even the ones that decided to stay, he's, he's giving them bonuses up front. He's sending them money. He's like, he's just so, oh my gosh, so amazing. I wanted to like cry when I met him because, you know, he, what really stood out to me was like, he told, thank you for fighting for Ukraine too. And he really made me realize like, we can all fight for, you know, these people that don't deserve to have their homes and lives taken from them. Um, even if we're doing so in the safety of our own, you know, homes. Yeah. And there's such a chilling effect on, you know, on just development in general, when something like this happens, I mean, not, not just, you know, within the city of Kiev or, or Kharkiv or wherever the, you know, the, you know, the existing violence is happening. I mean, it's, it's the other, you know, the other Baltics and the other areas where, you know, you start to look at independence and, and, you know, partnerships that are, you know, cross Atlantic partnerships that are happening and skills being, it's that whole great reshuffle, right? Is like, regardless of where you are, if you have talent and skill, then all of a sudden your geography is not a limitation. But mm -hmm. if, if you don't have ultimate freedom, you know, to pursue those things, then, you know, then that's something that's uh, a little harder to, uh, that's mm -hmm. something that's a little harder to overcome. So, yeah. I mean, do you know what, something I should also mention that he said to me that really just stood out was like, He's like, you know what, my guys, they've been with me, you know, since I started this thing, this company Upswat, and um, they've always been there for me. Like they, when, when bad things happen at the company, they're there, you know, and so now, like now is the time that we should be there, like the company should be there for them. I mean, and just how amazing that is. And, you know, Dimitri was just so humble and like super, like very almost like nonchalant, right? Like he's like, what else would I be? Like, he was like, of course I'm doing this. Of course I'm. I'm putting all the money possible. Um, of course, I'm like forwarding their salaries in advance so that they can deal with this now. Like, of course, I'm paying for their rent. Um, I, and I told him, I was like, I don't know if I can say the same for some American companies that would do that. This Here in America, we're still trying to just like pay people, right? We're working like 80 hours a week. But no, we're like, you know what you guys should need? Like a Peloton. Like that'll, that'll do. Um, you know, so it's just like... <laughs> Yeah, like it does. It is. It's, it's it is. A, how can the listeners link to your to your full interview with uh, Dimitri? You could check out workweek.com and just like scroll until you see my little face sticker. Um, you should be able to find it on my page. Um, but it also is on my Twitter. So you can kind of just check out my Twitter feed. It's it's pretty up there. Um, yeah, I didn't I didn't end up doing like a voice recording with him just because I wanted to be super intentional and like respectful of like just what he's going through. So I was really lucky that he even, you know, shared the story and um, just given how you know sensitive of a situation it is. But uh, what it's done is, is amazing because, you know, the amount of like DMs and, and emails I got after that story went out of people saying like, can you connect me to Dimitri? Like I want to help. And so, you know, that's like the beauty of, of, of journalism. That's the beauty of like storytelling is like, you can, you never know what, connection you're going to help make you never know like whose life you're going to change if you just are down to take the time to share someone's story you know like i don't see well don't that's see the, that's the human yeah. spotlight of it that you talked about earlier right yeah. without that uh you know without that you don't make that connection so that i thought that was you know i've, I've wanted to you know have you on the pod for a long time but when i when I saw those, those last two posts, I was, that's when I DM you and said, Oh man, we got to do this. We got to have, you know, <laughs> we got to have this conversation. So I, you know, I appreciate you doing that. I hope that uh, people will have some time to uh, link to your, to your work there at work week and, and sp specifically the stuff with Dimitri. It's just such, it, it's such a different way to report on something that we're all, you know, seeing in the news on a daily basis, but mm -hmm. Uh, you know, maybe not seeing the full story like I thought you kind of brought home with him. And, and of course, he's the one who brought it home, but you, you know, you're the one who has to bring it out of somebody too. So there's a, you know, there's yeah. that collaborative, you know, space there. So I, I know you have a, to get away from Ukraine for just a little bit, I know you have a master's degree from tech. 
Hey, you know my, you as you know, my daughter graduated from Texas Tech. You saw the tortillas flying at the wedding. I can't believe you threw tortillas at her wedding. That is so yeah, cool. that. Yeah, not my idea, but uh, I'll I'll take credit for the tortilla toss because I thought I, I oh thought I God. executed it flawlessly for a Longhorn. I mean, in the fa- oh wow, he's a Longhorn. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> should I have saved that till the end so that you uh, uh, is your connection breaking up? Oh um, man, oh man, I'm gonna go. No, uh, <laughs> no, that just means that you're like way smarter in high school than I was. <laughs> but you know, you're asked, I'm sure, a lot of times to to either you know, share some of your experience with, uh, you know, with the students at tech and, you know, what, what's your advice that you give to the next generation? What's, what's your message? Oh yeah, that's great. Um, I guess like if I think about myself as like a tech grad, uh, like, or when I was in, in school, I would really, and when I do talk to students for me, I really say like, I think the thing that made me really beneficial to myself was that I was very open to, like being very multifaceted. I always knew I wanted to be a journalist, but I didn't really know exactly how I wanted to do it. I figured, so I tried everything. Like I tried radio. I try. I like volunteered at the radio station. I volunteered at the broadcast station. I like wrote for the paper. Like I tried all the different things so that I could find, you know, what really felt right to me. And then the, even though I started out just writing, you know, those other skill sets, right. Apparent, obviously like translated into later. Now I'm on TV or I'm on camera all the time and now I'm on you know, like a podcast so that that the few months of radio and <laughs> internships must have helped um but yeah so that's what I would say um you know be find your passion but then be down to be very multifaceted in it um you know when I when I was a journalist I thought or, or in journalism school I thought I was going to you know maybe be like a, a court reporter uh or or like um or even follow like like the copy I thought I would maybe like you know, write about the bad guys and go get them. Uh, and now I'm just doing it in a different way. Right. Um, <laughs> had, had I, <laughs> well, you're kind of doing that anyway, but you know. I know I was say, I'm kind of just doing that. Anyway. <laughs> but anyway, I, but you know, I, I, if I had just closed myself off, you know, I once was mentoring a girl who was like, I felt like she's like, she was like, I really want to get to New York, but I only want to write about X. And I was like, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Like, if you're only down to write about one industry or one niche, like that's not really like, that's not that beneficial to you, especially when you're just starting out. Cause you never know, like, you know, you don't have to be an expert in niche markets to be a journalist in it. You just have to be try and be down to be very well researched and like be down to like immerse yourself entirely. Like I didn't know anything about finance when I got my first job out of college and grad school, which was as a, like a reporter covering the housing and mortgage industry. Yeah, I didn't know any, I didn't know, I barely knew how interest rates worked like when I was 19 years old, like I didn't know anything. And so I just got like, thrown into this world where I had to write finance, like B2B finance stories, like 10 of them a day. Like I worked at a crazy place, but um, so yeah, I would just like, I really want to encourage more college students to think of storytelling as a way to also be a part of the financial world um you know you don't have to be some like bro banker or you don't have to be like you know an analyst if you want you can like tell us the stories um because once you can report about an industry as complex as like the financial system then you can go do whatever you want like you can really do anything you want like now if i want to report about like cats i'd be the best cat reporter there. <laughs> <laughs> i'm like so good at deciphering like complex industries right like so that's what i would say i really like to try to encourage more well, the thing i noticed about yeah. your most of your really complex stuff that you write about you end up it, it's obvious you talk to the ceo or you talk to the cfo because there's you know there's a quote in there there's you can tell that you know some of the information is coming directly from the source and i'm like wow that is awesome because that's got to be like really really hard to get a hold of these people you know, get them to trust you, get them to give you a quote, Yeah, you know, put it all in there and do it two times a week. You know, that's, that's not easy. <laughs> that would be the other piece of advice. Um, I would say is like, especially if you're in journalism, but, um, you know, I, when I first started, I never, I just didn't say no to like meeting new people. And when it came to reaching out, I never was scared. Like, I don't know, I guess it was just like something in me that was always done. I was, I never had a hesitation to just pick up the phone and call someone and be like, can I talk to the CEO? Like, could I? And, and then what I think, 
I always did really well was when I did talk to a CEO or I did talk to someone big in the industry. I really just treated them like a human first. Um, and, and then that got them and got to know them and that actually got them to really like respect me and, um, and I got to respect them and we actually got to know each other and then you build a relationship and then all of a sudden, you know, it's, oh, you should meet this guy or you should meet this person or you should, you know, like, I remember like my first job in New York city, I was covering the auto finance market and I like got, uh, I just like, just by putting myself out there, I got an interview with like the CEO of like Nissan's finance arm, which is like a big deal in that space. Right. And my editors were like, oh my gosh, like you're like two months in, how'd you do it? And I was like, I literally would just tried. And I was like, nice. Like that's it. Like, be, like literally yeah, you, make, you make it sound so easy, but you just lead with kindness and you like, you lead with empathy and you lead with like, especially like a journalists, a lot of the time treat PR people kind of like crap, crappy. Um, I like to treat them nice as humans because duh, like not only, because it's the right thing to do because they're humans, but also like it, it, we're all tied together. Like um, some of the biggest interviews I've ever had is because a PR person that I have a good relationship with was like, you know what, you're the, you're the journalist that I think should tell this story. Um, because I've, I took the time to, you know, respond to their emails, you know, even if I can't write a story that they're pitching to me or whatever. So like relationships, kids is so important. And people don't, don't emphasize that. I think enough sometimes like journalists have this like, a little bit of a, like a high horse sometimes like yeah, I don't I don't got time for that or whatever like for all my PR friends out there if I don't respond to you I swear it's like just because I the because volume it's never because I <laughs> want it's never because I'm purposely trying to ignore you that was an unintentional flex if she doesn't if she didn't respond it's just because she's too popular no <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but now working in that in that traditional newsroom setting, though, you've written that you were often, or maybe you were, uh, the only woman, yes. the only person of color, and the only person under thirty. So, which one of those realities for you did you consider your biggest obstacle? Surprisingly, uh, surprisingly, my age has been harder. Um, which is why I just like, it's so cool to see like so many young people today, just like crush, crush the space. Um, uh, my age, I mean, gender of course was always one that was tough. Uh, you know, I, it's not uncommon in my past newsrooms for me to get cut off mid sentence, uh, to have my sentences completed for me, for me to like be teased because I don't know things about sports or I, or like, or I'm young. So like they make a joke about I don't know, something that happened in the eighties and I don't know about it, whatever. Like, and that's, you know, and all of it is tongue in cheek, but the thing is, is that what those are, are actually uh, microaggressions. I didn't really know what that was until I looked into it. I, it took enough times for those moments to happen to me in my career. Um, you know, in, in, in all the newsrooms I've been in, but it wasn't until I learned what these are, like what microaggressions are. And even though, even if they're unintentional, like people don't always, don't, people aren't always trying to hurt you. Like, I totally know that. And 90% of the time, they're not trying to hurt you. And so, but what they don't even realize is that by continuously saying that, you're like elevating what makes you like different and laying it out in a negative way, right? Like, so because, you know, an editor is cool with teasing me about it, now the reporter is all, like the other reporter is also down to tease me. Now everyone's down to tease me about it. And like, at the end of the day, that stuff does weigh, like it eventually weighs, it eventually weighs. And, you know, you can put on a, a smile and like, like it's funny too, guys. Until you're like treated until differently. Until you can't. Yeah. yeah. Until you're until you're very clearly treated differently. You know why am I actually like why am I you know assigned one beat, but uh, or paid to write about one beat? Yet I'm inherently the diversity reporter, and I'm also inherently the female, like the women reporter. I'm also inherent. Like, why is that? Because I'm the only person that you think can like cover it. I don't know. Like it's. Yeah, none yeah. of none. And, and why do I have to reach a certain age before I can do a certain yes, job? I mean, yes, I, yes, yes. Had I stayed, that's exactly why. Like going back to the risky thing. Had I stayed in like uh, traditional media, I would have been. You know, I told. I this is another good piece of advice for kids. Like for for kids is like, um, you have to tell yourself. I literally said to myself, "Do I want to give this institution the rest of my twenties? Do I want to give them my thirties before they decide that I'm valuable?" I don't know. I, that's yeah, that that's what really made me go like I don't know how much I'm willing to give the rest of my like 
time and my youth to something that isn't only, is only going to appreciate me when I'm older. No, I'm probably a little bit biased because I, when I find somebody that has a sub stack or something like what the FinTech or something like that, that just is a little bit more personally curated, I, I find the quality of it's just better. Mm -hmm. Um, and I find there's a fearless quality to it. And even if I don't agree with what is being said or how it's being said, it, it doesn't offend me. It's a, it's one of those situations where it's easy to read something and, and say, Oh, you know, I see where they're coming from. I don't necessarily agree with it, but you know, I don't have to, it's still mm -hmm. good work. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, and so, I mean, when, yeah, it really is. And so you're with you being in, in, you know, the fintech space just day in and day out. I mean, you've, you've got to see both trends in fintech and media. What are the, what are a couple of trends that you see happening that you, that you bet accelerate over the next year in both, in both fintech and in media? Yeah. I mean, media, I think we're only going to see the creator economy grow. I think you're going to see more versions of me, you know, leave their traditional roles and go off and, you know, start YouTube channels, start, um, their own newsletter, start their own thing, especially now that there's more platforms that are supporting creators so that they don't have to do it all on their own work week. Hey, creators out there, if you're interested, um, or any journalists out there that are, that have a cool beat to cover, we're always looking for more creators. Um, you know, and I get it like a salary and, and all that good stuff. So that's what I think is going to continue on in the media landscape. I think we're going to continue to see like more, um, kind of more influence uh, by uh, people that are independent creators. Um, you know, I, I think that the, between like the geopolitical landscape, between, you know, COVID, between everything that has happened in the last few years, um, you know, people are, people want to follow people. They don't necessarily are as trusting of institutions. And I think that's going to also play out in, in the media landscape moving forward, which is why what I did is not that risky uh, when you think about the future. In terms of fintech, um, you know, I, gosh, I, I'm trying really hard here to not talk about like, to not just talk about crypto. Um, but I think outside of that, because that is definitely probably the number one thing, like at the end of the day, like cri crypto is, is what is happening. It's, it's, you know, it's, I mean, it's helping people in Ukraine, um, which is, which is an amazing thing. It's right now, I think uh, the post said, it's 42 million right now for uh, donations and crypto donations for Ukraine. Uh, that's really amazing. So just so much around cryptocurrency and like financial inclusion is like the, is a huge trend um, going forward. I think we're also going to see a lot more uh, investments, right. In like international markets, we're already seeing it. Um, basically like what has happened in FinTech is like they spent the, the, the FinTech peoples have spent the last like <laughs> 10 years if i'd like to put it plainly the folks who work in fintech they have spent the last like 10 plus years really developing infrastructure payments like transactions that type of thing so now what we can do is we can actually move forward into you know the next thing which is why we're finally seeing a lot more like consumer facing fintech right and we're seeing so much of it and it's like super overwhelming almost i actually love continuing my journey on reporting about the wealth management industry and its relationship with fintech like i had been doing for the last few years i'm so happy i get to still do that because i think that you know we're on just the the beginning stages of fintech um really influencing wealth management i think wealth management and financial advice got like a nice smack in the face because of what has happened between GameStop and like the pandemic and more people finally being interested in getting financial advice from, you know, a professional or whatever, or even from an app. Um, I think there's just so much room for, for that industry to grow. And I know that like VCs are down to put their, their money into it. Um, cause it's, this is only going to continue. It's like the younger generation is only more interested in, in finance and financial advice and, um, so yeah, I, I see so much like growth there and, and it's barely scratched the surface in wealth tech. Uh, so I'm so excited to see where, you know, some of our friends in, in wealth tech that, that I have reported on before, I'm excited to see where they, where they head to. Um, and so yeah. what's the, what's the ultimate destination for a successful wealth tech or fintech company? Is it, is it realistic to think that they're going to continue to operate as a, as a separate entity in that kind of relatively small ecosystem, or is it more likely that the successful ones are destined to become a part of, you know, traditional tech and finance and kind of change from within? 
Yeah, it could be both. I mean, I would love to see them stand alone still um, and, and continue to kind of like work independently. Um, you know, like from, from my seat, like I, I hope that I, I'm, push, I'm pushing for Betterment. I want Betterment to, you know, have their IPO. I want like that to work out because, you know, I, I love this. I love these like fintech, independent fintech companies that are able to like kind of create a whole like financial services ecosystem right around them to be able to like serve people because I think people are just getting more and more distrusting of like traditional finance, like of big banks and and that type of thing. So I would love to to see to see that. And I think that it's totally possible. I think that there's enough money going into it. Um, I think that the infrastructure is there. And I think that there's enough areas of expansion, um, you know, using Betterment as an example, right? Like they're working on their B2B business. They're working like they're not just a robo advisor. Um, you know, that's why I kind of thought I was kind of just like, <laughs> like when everyone was trying to look at Betterment as maybe the next sell uh, after what had after Wealthfront was acquired um, by UBS. So anyways, um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll see probably some of the, the smaller fintechs that maybe do have more of those niche um audiences, you know, like, like, uh, RIA in a box was acquired by comply Sci, right. Which is just like a bigger, right. like compliance platform. I think we'll see those little like acquisitions for sure. Like that's definitely no question. And, um, that's kind of like sometimes the, the best strategy, right. When you're like a super, super tiny niche, like wealth tech or FinTech company and, um, is to get acquired. Um, so yeah, well, there is a, there is a proof of concept phase and then there's a, yeah. you know, there's a phase following that. I just, uh, you know, you, you phrased it perfectly when you just, you know, talked about Wealthfront and Betterment. I mean, that's the two different, you know, yeah. that's the two different that's options if we, you know, uh, if we follow that through. So what are your, what are your career and industry expectations over the next year? Are, are you still going to be taking my calls in March of 2023? <laughs> what do you think? Yes. Yes. Well, <laughs> um, I don't know when the show we is We get gonna... that on tape. We, we got that, right? I Good. know. Yeah. I know. I have I've publicly committed to always take James calls. Oh my god, of course I will remember you forever. Um, yeah, no, but the um, I'm excited. Well, good. My, my work here is done. Then good. I've, I've we're done. We can close this tape and silence. Um, but no, I, I'm excited. I have I don't know when this will air, but I am. Uh, I believe it's starting next week, and I'm sure it's fine that I talk about it. Um, but I am. Uh, I just booked uh, a new uh, YouTube live show. Uh, where me and two other really, really cool hosts that I'm sure you probably know, but I won't spill the beans just yet. Um, we are talking about like the biggest like financial news that is happening in the space. Um, so that's something new that I'm doing. Oh, well, that's uh, awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It goes back to that planning thing. Cause now my days are like really, really like when you have to do a live show every day. Yeah. Your, <laughs> your days are, are tight, yeah. but, anyway, but I'm excited about the opportunity and kind of uh, the growth that it has for just me as like a, as a, as a creator and learning how to like, you know, be on camera every day and do that type of thing. So, uh, I'm doing that. I'm, you know, obviously continuing the the podcast and, and newsletter. I am starting to host uh, events. I, I want to kind of do them like quarterly to, um, especially for like the women in the FinTech space. And I want to make them cool for me. It's really important to like use my platform to, um, kind of get away from, oh, well, like business conferences are like kind of lame or they're boring and there's like panels. And then there's like, no, like I want to do stuff completely different. Like I want to show the world, like, why not, like, why not have fintech and finance be cool? Why can't it be stylish? Why can't it be, you know, production? Why can't we have cool lights and the things and like be in a theater? Like, yeah, I, so I want to bring that element. Um, yeah. I mean, obviously the dream is like what the fintech ends up growing. Well, I, if you're going to make, if you're going to make finance cool, I'm all for it. Yeah. I mean, right. Why not? Like that's kind of what I'm here for. Right. It's like help make finance cool and fintech cool, but, um, and help make it feminine and help make it like all the, like young and, and all the things and give that fresh take. Um, yeah, that, that it so desperately needs, but, um, yeah. And I, I just, my dream with what the fintech is to eventually have, like, is to have a team. Like, I, I hope that there are, you know, I hope there's a whole team of me's. I hope that one day, like when I'm ready, that I can pass the baton on to a, you know, another version, like another Nicole, but who's like you know, another brown well, girl. Just the the other the other it. side of it is, I mean, because of you, I went on to Work Week and then saw the other people who are contributors. You know, writing about climate change and just all you know the different industries that they have there. W without my connection with you, I never go on to Work Week. Probably, I don't see them. Mm -hmm. and so there's a you know, there's, there's somebody who's really, really into climate that went on to work week to see, is it Daniel? I forget the name, but, uh, Nick. You know, they, 
Yeah, Nick. I'm sorry. Yeah, so they go on to read Nick, and they're like, "Wow, fintech. What's that? Let me uh, yeah. let me check out this, you know, this cast person yeah. chick and see what's going on." There's certainly room for that in our business, and the the collaborative effect I think is is something that we in our industry have underestimated the power of it for a long time. We competed yeah. against each other way way yeah. too long instead yeah. of just all working together and understanding what the benefits of that would be. And I, I think we're finally breaking through that. At least the, at least the younger generation definitely is. Mm-hmm. For sure. Uh, I mean, just... Yeah. I can't tell you how tired, like I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm tired of like preaching the, the I'm the only one, this thing, like, I, I don't want to do it anymore. I want there to be, and maybe other journalists have had different experiences, but this is mine. And I want, like, I think newsrooms should be filled with women. Like, I think that, you know, I, if I'm going to build a, what the FinTech team, like, yeah, all the, all the like young, young Brown girls out there that want to get into something like this, like hit me up. Cause I will eventually need help. I needed to help like yesterday, but I'll eventually, <laughs> <laughs> I need to like, you'll, you'll, EA, you'll like eventually it. be desperate when I call you in March of 2023 <laughs> and you're like, I just don't have time to talk to you. I know I promised, but uh. yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Two final questions for you. Cause I, I, I know you got it. Got to get going. You're the keynote for the FinTech World Summit 2022. Now, I just made that up, of course. Oh, my God. Everyone, I was like, damn. Yeah, yeah. Everyone is there. I mean, all the CEOs, all the movers and shakers, and you're they're all there to see you. What's your message? Oh, uh, I thought you were going to say what's my walkout song, and I had an answer ooh, to ooh, that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> Let back up. Pretend back I asked up, you first, up, what's the up. walkout song. <laughs> oh, okay. My walkout song is definitely... Uh, we can't stop by Miley Cyrus because I just think it'd be so cool to walk out and like it go. It's it's a party. We can do what we want. Like that would, just sounds really cool to me. Um, like and like it's my mouth. I could say what I want. Like it's kind of like it's very, yeah. It's like very like yeah. I I like it anyway. And well, I did my homework. I wasn't sure whether it's going to be classic rock or. Or, or hip hop or what? I mean, you're you're a hard person to peg on the music scene. So I know it's because I like it all. I I like hip hop and classic rock and all of it. So that's why it's hard to to pin. Me. So they, so they roll through the party in the USA album, and then right. what's your message? My list, my message to the to the the leaders in the space of, of fintech is, um, you know, to to work really hard to diversify your teams, and that means from the top down to the bottom up uh, and to, you know, always kind of lead with the understanding that FinTech is here to help more people um, have access to, you know, potential financial freedom. So in order to build products that actually reach that message, we as the FinTech industry need to look within and realize if we don't represent the audience that we're after, then we're never going to serve them well and we're never going to help change the world like fintech is supposed to amen maybe there's maybe there's no reason to ask a second question i think you uh, i think you know. question. <laughs> <laughs> oh well I'll, I'll give it to you so <clears throat> you're giving the commencement address for oh the college of communication and, and you That's can pick awesome, your, yeah. your favorite college it could be could be tech it could be you know harvard. could be harvard anywhere what's your message to all the graduates that's the only way I'm getting into Harvard is a commencement speech. Um, yeah, my message would be to um, to 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 follow like follow your follow your that damn dream. Like, don't just like if you want to be an artist, be an artist. Don't be go be an accountant just because you think you'll make money. You know, money is not the thing that's going to make you happy. Knowledge of money will make you happy, um, but you know, do do what you love, and the money will come. And you know, don't be afraid to try different things, even if it's not in the path that you thought you had for yourself. And then always, always be willing to just try. People ask me all the time how I got here. And it's, I just try, like, I literally just made an effort. They say, what do they say about like in college, like 90% is just showing up to class, like just go to class, come, come to this class of life and like (laughs) give it your all. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you showed up for us today. I love your work. I think you, uh, you, and you know what I, how I feel about it. I mean, you've, uh, you've done some just terrific work for our industry and, and probably been a real motivation for a lot of people. So 
Thank you so much for going on. If anybody uh, wants to uh, to link up, tell them how to uh, link up with what the uh, what the fintech and yeah. add to your growing subscriber base. Yeah, yeah. All right. So yes, uh, as of this recording, we are almost uh, we're we're chugging along to almost eight thousand subscribers, which is exciting. Um, to find me, I'm mostly on Twitter. You can usually find me there at Nicole Casperson. Um, you from there in my Twitter bio, you can click the link in there and subscribe to what the fintech. All you have to do is drop in your email and you'll hear from me every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, if you want, you can subscribe to the social investing network on YouTube uh, that is launching soon. That is where you'll find me talking about financial news daily. And um, yeah, and then subscribe to the podcast too, which is just, yeah, WTF in tech question mark. Uh, and that's where I interview a lot of really, really cool people and talk about a lot of things that I talked about here. Um, but yeah, really getting the inside scoop into what is in the brains of some of the biggest names in fintech. Awesome. Well, Nicole, thank you very much for joining us and uh, we appreciate you. And that's a wrap. I really hope you enjoyed our conversation on new media, fintech, and the surprising and really heartbreaking connection between our world and industry and the people of Ukraine. You can listen and subscribe to our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you prefer to listen. But most importantly, we thank you for engaging with us because we can only do our best work when you are here to listen. Thank you.